right. Okay, hopefully now you can see my screen, I hope. Yep, all good. Okay, great. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Joy Underhill, and um, I took a trip to Scotland in 2017 with, uh, hold on a second, there's somebody else coming in. I took a trip in 2017 with my husband for two weeks to Scotland, uh, various areas in Scotland. Um, and all of these photos are mine except for a few by a guy named Mike Lindsay, who's in my photo group. And uh, we actually, a couple of years ago, we did this, um, this presentation together and he had some photos that I kind of wanted to keep. And so he said, yeah, sure, go ahead, show those photos so I can talk to those. Um, this first photo, this first place is at, at a place called Blair Castle in Pitlochry. And Pitlochry is a place that if you go anywhere between Edinburgh and the Highlands, you almost have to go through there. It's a charming little town and really has a lot to offer. So that's the first photo. Come on. Okay, a little bit about the geography of Scotland. Um, as you can see, it's part of the British Isles. It's the Northern part of what we would consider England. And it's pretty far up there. I mean, they have Northern Lights and stuff up there. Um, and um, to, the, to the right, uh, I have a kind of a more specific map, map that shows the various people or the various places where we went with the exception of Glasgow. We didn't go there, but I kind of just wanted to put that in there as a place. And also um, my friend Mike went to Orkney, but I didn't go up there either. So, um, but I'll talk about these various places and I'll kind of show this map to get you oriented. Because as you can see, Scotland is full of inlets and, um, uh, you know, different firths, they call them, which are basically big inlets. Um, and the coastline is very interesting, which um, can make travel actually a challenge because there's so many places you can go, but it does take time to get from A to B. Uh, and there are very few fast roads in Scotland. So it's a nice slow trip and it's pleasurable in that way. Okay, so places to stay. Um, typically they're inns and B&Bs, uh, very much like Ireland if you've been there, as I understand, that was a trip we had canceled for, <laughs> for May this year, but I hear it's similar. Um, and I booked uh, all of our accommodations through Airbnb. Um, some of them were true B&Bs, some of them were um, a room in someone's home. So it was kind of mixed up and it was nice because we got to, um, to talk to the local people and to learn, you know, the activities that were close by and also to kind of check on our itineraries to see if they were reasonable or not, um, or things that we, we might want to check out that we hadn't, we hadn't planned on. So this uh, lovely little room to the left, was a place um, in Inverness, and the outside of it is the upper right. And we had a, a charming uh, visit there. Um, as it turned out, um, her son was a musician, and they had a music room set up, which we could kind of visit in. And he had a couple CDs there, so I'm gonna play you just a little clip to get you in the mood of Elephant Sessions, which her son was in, and he plays violin in it. It's a short clip. Joy, we can't. We couldn't hear the audio. I don't know if others could. Oh, okay. On it, but yeah, some somebody else said they couldn't hear it either. No, so. I either. Yeah. I okay. Sorry heard. about that. I thought it would come mm -hmm. through, but it didn't. So whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So getting around again, um, you have options. 
Um, ferries are great for getting around wherever there are islands or in, inlets or any kind of water challenges. Um, and driving is not for the faint of heart, but it didn't terrify us either. Um, we had driven on the other side of the road on a couple other trips. Um, this was the most challenging, but you kind of got used to it. Um, you know, it's not only driving on the other side of the road, but they're pretty much, especially up in the highlands, single lane roads. And that's pretty typical of what you see on the right. Um, and because the cars are small and the roads are narrow, uh, they have these pull off places. And you can see one there that's full of mud. Um, and that's basically what you do is you kind of watch for one another. And as you approach someone, they might blink or they might just pull off or they might go forward. But generally people were quite gracious when it came to pulling over and you kind of got in the rhythm of it. Um, and as you can see below, now that's if you're, if you're being driven, that was from Mike's pictures, um, you know, whether it's a bus or a, a big van and, um, yeah, you'll encounter sheep. Um, that's probably the biggest obstacle that and the oncoming cars. So, um, but I kind of liked it. I actually, when I came back, I went on 490 and I was like, these people are so rude, you know, they're not letting me in. They're going so fast. And it really took a little acclimating after kind of the politeness in Scotland. Come on screen. Well, I hope I'm not frozen here. Okay. All right, so castles, um, there are lots of them. And they're in all different um, states of repair and disrepair. Um, if, you love, if you love castles, you will love Scotland. <laughs> um, there's a ton of history here. Um, in fact, um, Mike told a story when we did the presentation together that there was a woman who was keeping um, a journal and he kind of glanced over and saw what she was writing. She kept on writing ADC, ADC. And he goes, what's, what's ADC? What does that mean? And she goes, it means another damn castle. So, um, and that's kind of how you felt after a while. But um, at the top is, and I, I'm going to massacre the pronunciation of some of these because it is Gaelic. Um, Eileen Dunnan Castle, I believe. And that's just at the entryway to Skye, which is an island. Um, and this lower one is Castle Stalker near Oban, which is on the western coast. And Castle Stalker also has a, a story behind it. If you are Monty Python fans, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, they were looking for the Holy Grail and, and they actually were seeking a castle called Castle Arg. Uh, which was the last word someone wrote in a diary as they were dying. So in a very late scene, they're sailing into Castle Stalker, or to, into Castle Stalker, which was Castle Arg. More castles. Um, Dunvegan Castle is also on Sky. Beautiful castle. Um, Inverary Castle, which it took me a while to figure out how to pronounce that, is again near Oban. And um, Inverary, you may recognize it. They were quite proud of this heritage. Um, if you were a fan of Downton Abbey, they filmed um, some scenes there because there was an uncle who lived in Scotland named Uncle Shrimpy. And he had a very um, interesting daughter named Rose. And they came, this was their castle. So there was a lot of Downton Abbey stuff on the walls and stuff, you know, posters and things in this particular castle. And to the lower right is inside the keep, that central area of Inverary. Um, they do this quite often. They take weapons and um, make them artistic, I guess you might say. Those are all guns. And then on the, in the inside, those are all uh, bayonets. So that was not uncommon. More castles. Um, this is Dunrobin, which is up north, uh, north of Inverness, and uh, Dunrobin was perfectly preserved. It actually, in 1964, there was, I can't remember the whole story, but it was something about 
the, the people didn't have errors or they chose not to, um, not to continue with private ownership. So it basically became, um, it, it, it became like a public trust. And so um, it basically looks on the inside like it did in 1964, right down to the place settings and the furniture and the pictures and everything else. Um, it also had outstanding grounds, and it was right on a firth, a large body of water, body of water that went out to the North Sea. So um, it was just a, a stunning place to spend a good half day. More castles, and I think this is the end of them. <laughs> um, Urquhart Castle um, is in Inverness. It's south of Inverness, and it's um, it's on Loch Ness, which everyone's heard of Loch Ness, but to be honest, it's kind of a very long, gloomy-looking lake. Um, so this is a, a ruin that is on one side of it, and on the other side, um, we took kind of the long way down Loch Ness. So uh, this is Mike's picture at the top. He went down the opposite side. And this Loch on Eilion Castle, I'm guessing on the pronunciation again, um, was on the opposite side of the lake and um, in kind of its own little pocket where it had like a, I'm going to say a large pond that you could walk around. And we did a lovely woodland walk around there. Um, and that was based on, on what our hostess suggested that we do. And um, in fact, she said she used to go down there with high school friends. And she said, when you get to the flat part, which this is the flat part of the castle, um, just shout because there are places where um, the echo is just incredible. And so we were kind of testing where it was the best echo. And um, so, and this was, uh, it probably was attached by a causeway to the land at one time, but it's flooded since that time. Woodlands, there are lots of them. So I would suggest if you ever plan to go to Scotland that you get in the habit of walking and getting some good walking shoes um, because the woodlands are absolutely beautiful. Um, as you can see, there isn't a lot of undergrowth like we have in our local forests um, and everything is covered with moss. Uh, it just makes it so striking. Uh, we were there in the fall and so you can see the fall leaves were were um, coming down, not as brilliant as here, but they were just, uh, it was absolutely beautiful to, to hike and, and just look at the natural greenery of these woods. Okay, now we're going to go up the East Coast from Edinburgh. Um, Edinburgh is pretty much, Edinburgh or Glasgow is where you would fly in, typically, unless you came up from England. And um, so we started in Edinburgh, and went north and kind of made a big loop and ended up there again. So I'll show you Edinburgh at the end. But um, the first real place we visited was St. Andrews, which of course is known for its uh, inventing golf. Um, you may have heard of the old course there. Um, but on the way, there are all these uh, really charming little villages, fishing villages along the way. And, and this, um, where you see Crail, that's very typical of the eastern Scottish coastline. It's, um, it's shallow, it's shoaly, I guess you might say. Um, I think those are shoals that go out like that. And, and, and really just charming to walk around and explore. Um, the lower picture was this little port town called Enster. And it's not Anstruther. And we, we stopped there really because we'd heard they had the best fish fry in the UK. And so we went to this little shop and they were very proud of, of that designation and we enjoyed the fish fry and it was indeed very good. So um, the St. Andrew's mini Kelpies are these statues that are replicas in miniature of larger, this, the same, um, you know, the regular sized Kelpies um, in a place called Stirling, which is kind of in that corner you have to go around by Edinburgh as you head towards St. Andrews, if you look at the map. And um, the kelp, if, if you look carefully, you can see a little, a little man standing at the base of that, that one horse head. And that's to scale. <laughs> okay, so these, 
that's how big you'd be in front of the real, the, the big Kelpies um, uh, statuary. So um, we didn't get to see that, but these were quite impressive on their own. And um, Kelpies are uh, legendary, uh, they're, they're mythical creatures in Scotland that um, I think they're meant to scare children, but they come out of the locks and they're horses that basically entice children to ride them. And if they do, then they drown. So there are stories warning of kind of the devious and dangerous nature of Kelpies um, in Scottish folklore. More pictures of St. Andrews, and this is definitely a, a, a good solid day trip. Um, to the upper right is the uh, castle at St. Andrews. There's both a castle and a cathedral, but this is the castle and they're both in ruins. Um, it was built around the 12th century and it was uh, the church center before the Protestant Reformation. So it's been destroyed and rebuilt a bunch of times as it changed hands between the Scottish and the British or the English. And um, there is a place there where um, there was a Protestant, at least one Protestant martyr who was, who was killed right outside here. So very historic place. And then this, uh, the Himalayas here is actually right on or right next to the old course at St. Andrews, the golf course. And these Himalayas, I wish we'd had more time because it's a miniature golf course and it costs all of about $5 to go there and, you know, and to play. Um, and as you can see, it's just a bunch of hard looking hills and uh, no windmills or, you know, obstacles to get by like we have here. Um, so that would have been a fun thing to do. And, and this was, this was where the women were allowed to play until actually very recently. So they were restricted to the Himalayas. Um, and then the, the, the bottom picture is of the beach there and probably what is, first of all, it's known because it's a beach in Scotland, which they really don't have this kind of a beach in many places. But, um, but also it's where they filmed Chariots of Fire when they did that famous running scene when they're running on the beach. So, and literally if, if I was, if I turned around 180 degrees, I'd be looking at the old course right there in St. Andrews. So I mentioned St. Andrews also had a cathedral that is in ruins. And this is a massive cathedral. This is 400 feet long. And this is just one end of it. If I turn around, there's a whole nother end. So um, it's the largest church in Scotland, also built in the 12th century and was the center of the Catholic church again until the Reformation. Um, not on this end, but on the opposite end, you can go up those steps and, and have a fabulous view of the waterfront there and a huge pier that goes off to the right. But um, this is a wonderful place to explore. And I actually wish I had a person in there so you could see the size of this because it's, it's really hard to, to see the scale of it. Um, and St. Andrews is also home to St. Andrews University, which is one of the most renowned and oldest universities in, um, in the British Isles. Um, it, was, but it was built, started anyway, in the 1400s and only Oxford and Cambridge are older. And St. Andrews University, this is the old part, which is relatively small, but it's really spread throughout the city. So you kind of, you walk in and out of it. Um, and let's see, Prince William went there, among other people, I'm sure. So a few just kind of Scottish things. Um, the mushroom is just a nice mushroom shot. There's nothing Scottish about it, except it happened to be in Scotland. But um, the bagpiper, um, he was actually in Edinburgh and you know, he's got the typical red hair and he's wearing his, his tartan. And in Scotland, they've got all these different tartans for different clans, which um, they're very proud of. Uh, and you can go into stores and buy them if you happen to have any Scottish ancestry, it's worth looking up. Um, you can get little books sometimes that will tell you about the name Campbell or MacDonald or, um, you know, these different Scottish names, what they mean and, and kind of their history. Um, and tartans originally were, um, I believe they are um, nine yards long, like when they say the whole nine yards. And it's a large piece of cloth that they could use 
not only to drape like this, but also to wrap around themselves to use as blankets, um, probably to bind wounds, um, to cover in the rain. So it was a very practical piece of, of cloth, um, especially as, as um, the conditions, the weather conditions got challenging. Um, and the sign, um, actually Mike captured the sign, I'm glad he did, because when you get into the highlands, everything is bilingual in, and this is written in Gaelic, which is not the same exactly as Gaelic, um, like they have in Ireland, but they're so close, I couldn't tell the difference. And what's interesting is you can see, like in Beer Nice, you can kind of get Inverness from that. But then you look at Sky, and you, you can't figure out how to pronounce it or even how they got Sky out of that. So, um, you know, sometimes you have better luck figuring it out. And thank goodness it's uh, bilingual. That's all I can say. <laughs> Okay, another very Scottish thing is haggis. And I borrowed this picture at the bottom to show you what it looks like. Um, it's basically kind of all the, all the parts of a sheep that are, they don't use for other things uh, that they kind of grind up and put in. It's, like, it's kind of like what you'd make sausage out of, but then they add other things and they cook it in a sheep's stomach. So of course you have to try this. And it, to be honest, it tasted like uh, kind of oatmeal and with salty brown stuff in it. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. Um, up at the top there, uh, Mike took a picture of when they were actually ceremonially slicing into the haggis. Um, but they serve it different ways, sometimes on baked potatoes, just sometimes a blob of it on your plate. And my husband here is eating it uh, kind of a fancy way. It was wrapped in phyllo dough with, I believe, some mashed potato or maybe mashed turnip. Um, so it didn't do much for me, but it didn't offend either. So you have to try it. Okay. Um, near Inverness, um, you can see it on the map there. Um, there's a very famous place, uh, called Culloden and the Culloden battlefield is actually a very sober place. Um, because in 1746, there was a very famous battle here that, um, where the British really uh, ran, um, they they basically kind of they had a, they had a conflict there and it went very badly for the for the Scots and it was really the beginning of the end of the clan structure in the Highlands. Um, they'd been battling with them for years. It wasn't a new thing, but this was really the the beginning of it. You may have heard of Bonnie Prince Charles. Um, this was his battle, his last battle. And he actually um, later escaped to the Isle of Skye, dressed like a woman, and got smuggled out of the country. Um, but it was catastrophic, and it began a period of uh, huge decline for the clan culture and a lot of the Scottish um, traditions. Um, it was very difficult. So this is the site of the battle. They have a, a museum that explains all this here and, and actually has quite a dramatic um, on all, all four walls, they have a video, so you're like in the middle of the battle, and, and they explain kind of what happened. Um, and then you go out and visit it, and it's really a more, you know, if you step off the path, you could be stepping in, you know, a few inches of, of water. <laughs> it's pretty damp there. Um, and then there's just these stones with the different clans to acknowledge the people they lost there. So, and the only structure is this... Um, is this house, which I believe they used as a field hospital, um, but there's not, there's really, there's not a lot else there. So it was a very sober uh, place, but, but also an important place to understand, you know, the history and, and, and the importance of this time. So after Culloden, um, the English decided, uh, well, there was a period of about a hundred years, um, that was referred to as the Highland Clearances. And uh, it, basically, it, during that time, England, um, they outlawed clan tartans, bagpipes, and the Gaelic language. So they did everything they could to try to really destroy Scottish culture and power. Um, and it really was the end of the Highland culture in many ways. 
So I think now when you see the Scots so proud of their tartans and their traditions, it's, an, it's a return to, to that pride. Um, but the, they call it the clearances uh, because the British at the time, wool was becoming a very valuable commodity and they thought this is a great place to introduce sheep um, because it had been mostly agricultural before that. So they brought in sheep and they removed people. Um, literally would remove them from their houses and burn them down if they didn't pledge allegiance. And, and also they took many of the people and uh, sent them to the colonies to here for um, indentured servitude. So, you know, it was a really very destructive time uh, for the Scottish culture. Um, and then near the tail end of that, they did have a version, another, their own version of the potato famine that the Irish had. It wasn't as bad, but um, that also, you know, did a number on them. So, um, you know, at, at one point they, they, they refer to these things called crofters cottages, which are, you know, they're just very simple little homes. And um, at one point they were burning about 2000 of those a day. So this is very sad history to learn, but again, it was very educational. I, I really just didn't know the history of Scotland and what had happened up there. And you can see why there's a lot of bitterness or there had been a lot of bitterness between the two nations, even though they're the same nation now. Um, one thing that you, you actually see quite a bit of in Scotland and as, as in other places in the British Isles are Neolithic ruins. And this is a place very close to Culloden called the Clava Cairns, but there are others, there are lots of them. And, um, and they're basically burial sites, but they're, um, you know, they did have, they were usually burial sites of a small family um, and a significant family. So these things are quite ornate and, you know, you can walk in them and look around and see things. It's, you know, the, the remains have been removed. Um, and they do have standing stones in some places too. So there may have been astrological significance, but some of these, they, pro they date maybe to about 4,000 years ago. Um, you know, they don't always know what people did back then. So um, there's a, a lovely, um, it's called the Great Glen that extends between Inverness and Glencoe and Oban. You can kind of see it there where they're kind of like almost uh, the, the, it almost looks like part of the country was gonna be cut off from another by, by land or by, by a valley. And there is a valley there. And um, Glencoe is close to Oban. And it's actually, if again, I'm gonna to refer to, um, to Hollywood here, but for anybody who's um, a fan of Game of Thrones, you may have heard of the Red Wedding. And the Red Wedding took inspiration directly from what happened in Glencoe. Um, Glencoe is a lovely valley. It, unfortunately, Mike took the picture during summer. I took the picture on the right during fall. And you can see the weather was about the same both, both days. Um, pretty misty. But um, in the, the late 1600s, this was the site of a massacre um, similar to the Red Wedding, where, where basically the, the clan uh, Campbell invited the clan MacDonald in and then killed about 30 of them. So very unhospitable. Um, but it was used in a, as an example of what happened if you didn't comply with uh, British rule. So, um, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a story that's still told. I mean, you know, you'll go there and you'll read about their equivalent of the Red Wedding. Um, a little bit north of um, Glencoe, I think, is, um, is a place called Ben Nevis, which is the highest peak in Scotland. It's 4,400 feet, so it's not, it's not, I you know we wouldn't call it a mountain by, you know, U.S. scale, but it's a, it's a good size mountain, and um, I was just kind of taken because of the colors uh, here, and the layers of colors, and you can see it was a gloomy day, and, um, but this is top, typical in Scotland that the weather can change every 10 minutes and, and does. So um, not unlike here. Um, Oban, which is just a little south of Glencoe, is really a gorgeous little port town. And um, there's a few stories to tell here. Um, 
in Oban, there you'll notice um, this this round structure on the top of a hill. It's quite characteristic, but it's also empty. I mean, there's nothing in there, and it was um, it was actually it's called McCaig, McCaig's Tower, and they refer to it as McCaig's Folly because there was a, a prominent family, a banker's family, and he decided he wanted to um, construct this this Romanesque um, uh, structure to his family, to honor his family. But then he died under construction, never got done. So there it sits, kind of just this round circular formation there, or structure, building. But it's kind of fun to go up there. It's a beautiful view. And um, we were getting lunch over by the where the ferries were, because this is ferry central for all of the western part of Scotland. Um, and it started to rain. We were having these wonderful fresh smoked salmon sandwiches and looking for some sort of shelter. And I turned around and there was this double rainbow. And I just scooted over, had time for about seven shots. And that was it, it was gone. So it was really a very lucky time to be there. Um, Oven also uh, is a place where you can take, this is why we went to Oven. But um, unfortunately, <laughs> it was thwarted. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of ferries that come out of here and go to the outer islands, like the Isle of Mull, where they make a wonderful cheddar. Um, Iona, which is the birthplace of Scottish Catholicism. It's a very old monastery out there. And a, an island called Strata, which are these basalt columns. It's really nothing but columns that you can explore a little bit. So we were scheduled to go on that. Unfortunately, a freak hurricane came through Northern Ireland. So it got canceled and we had to have alternate plans. But um, so we have to go back, that's all I can say. Um, we also went to the Oban Distillery, which was, you may have heard of Oban Scotch. It's, it's quite renowned and um, very old place and, um, and had a lovely tasting there. That was a, that was a special time. Um, more Neolithic room, ruins near Oban on our, our alternate day, our alternate to the, to the cruise we were going to do. Um, not sure how to pronounce this one, Dunkercraig, something like that. Another cairn, um, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, this one, actually, you can't see it in this picture, but you could crawl into it. You could go inside it. It kind of had about maybe an 18-inch clearance. Um, <laughs> but we kind of decided, you know, there's a lot of stones there. I, you know, I don't, they've been there for a while. We, we don't want to be caught anyway, so we didn't crawl in, but you can. Okay, um, now we're going to move on to the Isle of Skye, which um, is really extraordinary. A lot of people love Skye, and you can see why, because it's just one vista after another. Um, it has these severe cliffs. And um, as one of my friends said that we were traveling, that we met up with here, he said, you know, I've, in driving around, it seems like it has to be a drop of more than 80 feet for them to bother with a guardrail, which is very true. <laughs> and uh, it was, um, but it was actually, it was just spectacular. And these are a couple of uh, Mike's shots. The one on the right's called the kilts for obvious reasons, but just extraordinary landscape. Um, and then the one on the left is the old man of store. And that's actually a, um, you can't see it too well in this picture, but the, the pointy um, rock there to the right is the old man of store. And it's actually quite large, but it looks like this was taken from a distance. And then on the Isle of Skye, um, one place we stopped because it was just along the side of the road and it was so picturesque was Dunvegan Cemetery. Um, and it's a it's a modern cemetery and an ancient cemetery both, and you can see the the um, the chapel there is in ruins, but it it was a lovely place to explore and and had some standing stone out there. We didn't even go up there um, on the left, um, and then um, we spent a wonderful half day at a place called Coral Beach, which takes well everything takes an hour or forty five minutes to get to in Sky because the roads are so narrow and you're going in and out of places, you know, like just hard to get to places. So um, Coral Beach 
um, in the, the lower picture. You can see it better. Um, it literally is pink coral that this northern cold water coral that grows there and just gets crushed up and the and the beaches i'm not going to say it's pink exactly or coral but it, it is light colored um and of course we happen to be there with a rainbow you know because of the changeable weather we actually kind of got used to rainbows and that island that you can see far out where the rainbow is is the outer hebrides which is a series of islands that kind of is offshore you definitely have to take you know, a, a boat to get out there. Um, and I think it's pretty forbidding out there. It would be interesting to explore, but it's a, they're pretty big islands out there. So, uh, but it was a fun place to walk out there. It was just beautiful and a beautiful time of day. Uh, another place we visited on Sky was called the Fairy Pools. It's kind of a dismal day, but this is uh, uh, not really a hard walk. It's a slight uphill. Um, and it's a series of cascades of, of small waterfalls, some larger than others, but none were huge, but they just kept cascading down. And you can kind of see here um, the heather that, that people talk about, um, the beautiful purple heather of the summertime turns a rust color in, in the fall. And I found it just as extraordinary as, you know, as that other color would have been. I wasn't disappointed by, at all by the color of the heather. Um, this pool on the right um, that's kind of greenish is actually quite, quite green. And in the summertime when it's a little warmer, uh, people do go bathing there. So, um, and this is just a, a really extraordinary place to go. Uh, another Isle of Skye place is called Neist Point. And I think this was the windiest day I've ever experienced probably. Um, it's a long, um, what do I want to say, like outcropping of rock. You can see a little bit of it to the left, but that's really a huge, a huge long, probably a mile long outcropping. And of course, sheep, um, I have no idea who was, who was taking care of the sheep out there, but, um, but somebody had built a wall, um, which seemed like an unlikely place, but maybe it was to keep them from being swept over or something, I don't know. Um, but this point on the upper right is, is if you turn around from the sheet picture, okay, that's what you see. And um, like I said, it was so windy, I really kept my distance from the edge because you can see what happens at the edge, how it, it breaks away. Um, and then if you go around the corner of that big, that big cliff, then you see the lighthouse, okay? Which again, they've got, it's, it appears they have electricity out there but this is really remote. So um, it was really, it, it was a wonderful place to go, but very, very windy, at least the day we were there. A little about animal life, of course, um, sheep, <laughs> lots of sheep. Um, and uh, Mike put, had this picture of the, the, um, uh, the shepherd, the, the sheep dogs. Um, he went to a, a demonstration where they were showing, you know, what they can do. And, and they're, they're very important um, because they, you know, they're so well trained um, that I think it's really a pleasure to watch them. And I don't know how they would manage the sheep otherwise. Um, the two cows at the bottom are called, they refer to them as hairy coos. Um, they're typically brown, like the one on the right, but I did find a black herd, which was unusual. So it was good to, um, you know, just kind of see the different varieties, but they're, they're long haired, they're charming looking, and they're as hardy as can be. They don't mind the cold weather, so. Um, this is a picture from Mike also. He went up to Orkney, which are the islands off the very north coast um, of Scotland. And um, this place is called Hoy Island, and I think he just caught it at a great time of day, but. Like I said, there's lots of islands, there's lots of peninsulas and, and things to explore, um, especially on the western and the northern coasts. Um, they do have stone circles like they do in, you know, in England, like in Stonehenge. Um, again, they're Neolithic, they're very old. Um, Mike took this picture of the Ring of Brodger in Orkney, uh, which looks like a 
kind of an organized one, not as organized as say Stonehenge, but used for similar purposes, which they think was astrological and ceremonial. But again, these are so old and we don't really have records of what these people use these for. Um, and then near Oban, there's one called, well, good question, Ballymenoch, maybe something like that, I don't know. Um, and that was in literally in the middle of a sheep field. We had to kind of hike out there from the road, uh, but they, they don't care. They'll let you walk out there and take a look at it. And, and there you go, these standing stones. Uh, Mike went up to Scarabray, which is on the Orkney Islands. Um, that would be a full day trip to go up there and come back um, because it's, it's a little bit out there. And it, as you can see, there's like no trees. And they discovered um, these were all covered up, but these are Neolithic homes that they lived in. Um, I can't speak to, the, to them a lot because I didn't visit them, but um, they do have, uh, they do show how they think that they lived, you know what I mean, and, and explain it. And it's supposedly a, a fascinating place. I'd love to get there on another trip. Um, it can be hard to choose where you have to go when you only have two weeks. Um, and one place we went um, that was actually kind of interesting was the Cranog Center. And Cranogs, they also have some of these, I believe, in Ireland. And these were built on the lakes. So this was a lake near Pitlochry, kind of in the middle of the country. And they've been able to, by using um, planes and certain observation techniques, they've been able to identify these in, in lakes all over Scotland. Um, and they were Neolithic homes and they built them over the lake. So, and they were thinking probably that they were for defensive reasons. This is a recreation. Um, there aren't any left because obviously they're made of wood, but they would, you know, they would pound the, the, the big timbers down into the ground and then just keep piling on top of it, you know, if they sank or if they rotted and then eventually abandon them. But you can see there's real defensive um, advantages to being out on the water like this. And they can see, you know, from the air, like kind of these, some of them actually turned into islands as the wood deteriorated and, and you know, seeds could plant themselves on there and, and they, they're actually islands. But, um, but other ones you can see just under the surface of the water because they're these strange circular areas that are more shallow. Another place outside of, of um, Oban was called Dunad Fort, which is a natural huge stone outcropping in the middle of a plain, I guess you'd say. Um, and this is quite ancient. Um, it dates to, let me see, the hill fort, the actual, they built a fort on this, this hill, into the hill actually, dates to the Iron Age. And it remained really significant until around 500 years after the Romans left Scotland. And um, what they would do here, there was, it was actually called the Kingdom of Scotty, um, which came from Ireland, these people originally. And as part of their ceremonies, um, on the picture on the right, you can see sort of a puddle in the foreground. And that actually looks like a footprint because it was a footprint. And when as part of their coronation ceremony, the king would literally put his foot there and it was a way of signifying his, um, like his marriage to the land or his loyalty to the land. So um, it's quite interesting. There's Pictish carvings in these rocks and um, it, it just, it seems like it's in the middle of nowhere, but this was a very significant place many years ago. And they think he probably had the kings typically had about a size six foot from measurements. Okay, well, it's hard to go to Scotland and not have scotch, which they call whiskey. Um, we went to several distilleries and it was very educational. Um, usually you can't take pictures inside the distilleries, but we did find one where we could. And it's the smallest distillery in Scotland, many of them have become quite corporate and large and they've built, they've bought up other smaller um, 
distilleries, but this was a small one called Edredor, and that was in that little town of Pet Lockery, which I keep talking about. Um, so you can see they're distilling machines, I guess they are, or the whatever you call those distillers, I guess, those, those long necked um, cooling devices is really what they are. Um, and then, you know, they took us and they, sh they explained all about the process. They showed us all these barrels, many of which were quite old. In fact, there was one by the door and it was a big cask. It wasn't like these smaller barrels you see here. And they had bought up a lot of, a lot of whiskey from smaller distillers who were going out of business. And that was one of those. It was the only one left and it's quite old and it's one of a kind. And she said, and when we left, she said, well, we, we leave this one by the door because the can had a big sliding door. And when we asked why, she said, well, because if there's a fire, this is the first one we would roll out because it's valued at a quarter of a million dollars. So um, yeah, interesting story. And then um, at the top, this little bar called Saucy's Bar is, um, <laughs> this was in one of our B&Bs. Um, someone had made this for him, and this is very much how Scottish bars look. I mean, they have these, they have the, the bottles mounted on the, on the wall, and there's a thing called a wee dram, which is a very specific measurement. It's not just a little slosh of whiskey. It is a measurement that they adhere to when you ask for a scotch or a, you ask for a whiskey. So he had this all set up, and, you know, he has some lovely um, scotches up there. More distilleries. We went to uh, Glen Morangy, which uh, you may have heard of. They they're a huge um, distiller and they they distribute widely. Um, and it is pronounced Glen Morangy like orange because they said it's easy to mispronounce that or to not know how it's pronounced. So we were um, we learned that quickly. Um, and to the right is Blair Athol, which is in again Pit Lockery. Um, and I was, we didn't visit this one, but it's a common one because it's very accessible to the road. Um, but I was so taken with the, the beautiful um, vines at that time of year. Um, and then Mike took a little bit of, speaking of whiskey, uh, just a little footage of the bar scene. Um, and it's enjoyable because you see people singing along. So I hope you'll be able to hear this. And if you can't, I apologize. We can't hear it, Joy. Okay, I didn't know if you could hear that or not. Probably not, which is too bad. But um, okay, final place I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a little bit is Edinburgh. It's um, you know, like I said, you would probably fly into here or almost certainly go here. Um, it's, it's ba Edinburgh is interesting because it's basically um, two cities. It's the old city, which is called Old Town, and then it's New Town. And uh, the Old Town actually has an area, uh, very touristy, but people live here too, um, called the Royal Mile. And the Royal Mile, I think it's longer than a mile, but it kind of winds downhill from Edinburgh Castle which you can see on the upper right, all the way down to what the Royal Palace was, which was called Holyrood, which is close to where you see that big, that big outcropping there, that kind of large hill. And that large hill is called Arthur's Seat. Okay, so you get an idea of the distances here. Um, we did actually walk the entire Royal Mile, which is, you know, you can spend a lot of time there. It's very touristy, but it's also very interesting. And, um, and then at the opposite end, we didn't do it in the same day, we walked up Arthur's Seat, which takes you to the very top and gives you a 360 degree view of the whole area. You can see all the water, you can see everything um, looking in the other direction. So, um, so it was really worth it. It's, it's not, I think it was 800 feet high. Um, so it's a bit of a hike, but I'm not gonna say it was, um, stressful. I, I brought my hiking stick just because there were steep parts, but um, but it was quite doable and, and I think really worth it. Um, 
On the left, just a typical Edinburgh scene, a lot of hills. Um, the city is actually kind of, you know, the new town and the old town are split by a very large railway station. So you kind of know where you are. Um, and um, there are some really good landmarks. It's an easy city to navigate, I think, because of the landmarks. Um, Mike was there in August, which is festival month, a uh, very crowded time. Um, if you go in August, you have to book ahead, way ahead, um, just because Edinburgh fills up. Um, they were the inventors of the Fringe Festival, the original Fringe Festival, and um, this is this it's it's festival time all the time you, you see acts all the time on the streets and also in different venues that you can go to so this was just a shot he took of of one of the performing uh groups there so very interesting more pictures of edinburgh um saint giles church is probably um one of the best known landmarks because it's tall and it's it's um, up high. So you can spot it anywhere. Like I said, you can use it for navigation. Um, the toll house is just, I loved it. it. It really was a toll house at one time. And we did have lunch here and I would not recommend the lunch, but, um, but it's a, it's a interesting looking building. And then, um, there's a lot, they use basalt a lot in their architecture, their stone, and it turns very black, uh, almost smoky. So um, Edinburgh uses so much of it and it's so old that it really gives you a, um, it's a very spooky feeling. Plus there are lots of stories of the dungeons and you know, you can do these ghost tours and it, it's really a lot of fun, you know, to, to engage in those things. We didn't, we didn't have the time to be honest to do that. But um, you know, a lot of people do enjoy it and it's, it's, uh, it's a fun thing to do. Um, in Edinburgh, they have these things called closes. Um, you'll see the name of something close, right? And basically, it's a little dead end, uh, usually where people live. And it's just there's there's all these little, uh, I'm going to call them dead ends, but they're called closes. And th there's a, a picture of one of them there. Um, they're everywhere. And I, I think it gives people a, a sense of privacy, but it also kind of adds to the mystique of the city to have all these little nooks and crannies you can explore. Um, and as I mentioned, Edinburgh is kind of split in half between Newtown and Old Town. And um, this monument is very close to the railway station, this Sir Walter Scott monument. So, um, and this is more the commercial district. Um, this particular street, it's called Prince's Street. It's where the trams are. It's where you come in. If you're coming from the airport, they have a tram directly here. Um, it's about a 45 minute ride. So it's very convenient. Okay, now here's another one you probably aren't going to be able to hear, unfortunately, so I'll only run a little bit of it. But Mike um, took some video of the military tattoo, which is probably one of the most popular things to see during the month of August. And it's done at Edinburgh Castle. They literally come out of the castle with a little fire in the background. And it's a succession of military bands. And of course, Scotland starts with bagpipes. And... Um, I'll run it a little bit anyway, just so you can see some of the tartans, even if you can't hear it. Um, but it's a massive procession, and it's just, it's really something to see. And again, it's something you might want to book a year in advance. <laughs> I don't know during COVID times, but it, this is something that fills up um, this particular display. So I'll run it just a little bit, and then I'm going to cut it short because I think you can't hear it.
Okay, so this last slide is really just a question slide. So we'll, we'll go into a discussion. I'll stop recording. Um, on the right is John Knox. Um, he, he's, he's, he's got a very nice sculpture there in um, St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. And to the left is the Coral Beach, again, a place I was really taken with. So, okay, I'm gonna allow you to, you can unmute yourselves and ask questions. I'm gonna stop the recording and, and we'll talk. Your pictures are.